Greetings all! Churchill is a strange anachronism, a modern, successful tank by World War II standards, yet an outdated looking design. Here are five pieces of trivia you can use to wow your friends and family at the dinner table in the event that the tank happens to come up in conversation. Combine Titanic and Tog, and you get something of a Churchill. Now, of course, the project came before Tog, but you get the idea. Tog, famously enough, was the answer to the question nobody asked. What happens if fighting in World War II Europe returns to trench warfare? However, the reality was that it was a question that the British General Staff specifically had asked on the 1st of September 1939. The previous infantry tanks which had been developed were all relatively small tanks. Compact, well-armoured, transportable, and Valentine had been approved for production but four months previously. The catch was that the British were at the time still emphasising warfare in places like Egypt, which, you will recall, is where their deployed armoured unit was based. Now the British were looking at fighting Germany in Northern Europe, and it seemed reasonable that whatever happened last time may happen this time. Those small infantry tanks may have difficulty traversing heavily shelled, pockmarked terrain with trenches and the like. As a result, specifications for a suitable tank were drawn up. Initially, it was going to be a redux of the lozenge tanks, with side sponsons with two pounders and bases and full height track system, before some sanity reasserted itself. It was decided that this new vehicle, to be called A20, would have a turret up top. The sponsons reduced to mere machine gun firing ports. The contract to build it was given to Harland and Wolf in Northern Ireland, the same crowd which built Titanic. Even this was questioned though, as the British were not sure there was much efficiency to shipping parts or hulls back and forth across the North Channel to build the tanks. Of course, as we all know, A20 proved to be not entirely successful, and Vauxhall stepped in to make A22, which would actually become. Churchill. As an aside, Albert Stern of World War I tank design fame was brought in to examine A20. He didn't seem to be troubled by the design, but he had nothing good to say about the Merritt Brown gearbox. There might be a reason that no more of his designs were accepted. Like other tanks, Churchill was ordered straight into mass production. After puttering about a little bit with the designs in the first half of 1940, the fall of France in June put a little urgency into things. Churchill demanded that the 500 of these new tanks be built by March of 41. I have observed before, and I shall observe again now, that typically it would take about two years for a tank program to go from conceptualization to mass production and fielding. A year and a half in some happy cases. But generally, you can imagine 18 to 24 months to get a satisfactory product. Churchill is looking for about eight. Vauxhall, who also owned engine manufacturer Bedford, and had been brought in to advise on the suspension of A20, became the lead company for the design and manufacture of A22. By October, a pilot started being built, but there were still issues with the detail design. Churchill sent a letter telling the folks to stop mucking around new designs and changes and just build the thing. Given the threat of invasion from Germany had receded at this point, and the British seemed to be doing all right in the desert, Quite what the urgency now was, I'm not actually sure. Regardless, 485 vehicles were ordered from the factories in October, two months before the first pilot model appeared in Luton. By March, eight tanks had been built and were in testing. Only to discover that, surprise, surprise, they had teething troubles to fix. Indeed, until problems were fixed, tanks were issued with a supplemented user's manual printed by Vauxhall listing all the known problems with the tank and what to watch out for. One probably wouldn't see that much these days. Two of these tanks were shipped to North Africa for testing. However, they were shipped as deck cargo and by the time they got to Egypt, they were so rusted as to be unusable until a shed load of spare parts arrived a month later. The Churchill carrier actually was supposed to be an anti-tank vehicle. In World of Tanks, we have a number of vehicles which were really supposed to be assault guns or which you were kind of sort of shoehorned into a tank destroyer role as we have no infantry to obliterate. One might think that the Churchill Carrier 3-inch 
20 hundredweight might be one of those vehicles similar to Stungerschutz or SU-152, but that would be incorrect. In this case, the carrier was specifically designed as an anti-tank gun. Certainly, there were suggestions by Royal Artillery to turn the vehicle into a carriage for a 25-pounder or even a 6-inch field gun. However, that was going to fit. But the more pressing priority in March of 41 was still the perceived threat of German invasion. The factories were cranking out the two-pounder guns for which they were tooled as fast as they could, which meant that no production capacity was available to switch to the somewhat superior six-pounder. Until there was a breather in fielding requirements to allow factories to retool, the standard anti-tank gun would be the two-pounder, and there was the question of how to deal with any more heavily armored German tanks which may appear in the meantime. The 17-pounder was in the design phase, but also would not show up for a while yet. The solution, as found, was an obsolescent anti-aircraft gun, the 3-inch 20 weight of 1914, a joint Army-Navy weapon. In Army service, they began becoming available due to being replaced by the excellent 3.7-inch anti-aircraft gun, but just because it could no longer send a shell to the desired altitude did not mean that it still couldn't fling a very large piece of metal very quickly at a tank. In a hurried cobbling together, 50 of the decidedly hideous looking carriers were produced, uh, but by this point two other problems came about. Firstly, the 17-pounder had entered service, so there was already a move afoot to fit it to a better vehicle. And secondly, the original purpose for which the vehicle was made was no longer applicable as it seemed that the Germans now had much bigger problems in the east than invading Britain. Most of the vehicles were thus converted to specialty vehicles, such as recovery. Churchill's mobility. Depending on who you talk to, Churchill had terrible mobility, as evidenced by all those tanks getting stuck at the beach on Dieppe, or fantastic mobility, as evidenced at Longstop Hill and Steamroller Farm, where they climbed notable hills. Certainly in North Africa, Churchill had quickly earned a reputation as being something of a mountain goat. Yet it was almost a year into the Italian campaign before Churchill showed up, where one might think that the mountainous terrain would suit Churchill. Why? Well, what isn't being asked so much is great mobility as compared to what? The Churchills on Longstop Hill were engaged by Panzer IVs, which had also made it to the top. At Steamroller Farm, however, the Germans considered the hill to be unscalable by tanks. First Armoured Division decided to settle the matter, and they ran a couple of Churchills, Shermans, and a turretless Stewart over a hill course to include side slopes to find out. It was a rough course, both the first Sherman and first Churchill to try broke tracks before the end of their runs. In the end, the official conclusion was that there was little between the three tank types, although the M4 might have been a little bit more tricky to control on the side slope. Generally speaking, if the Churchill could cross an obstacle, and it didn't cross everything, the Sherman did too. Italy provided several problems for Churchill. Firstly, the infrastructure wasn't great for 40-ton vehicles. The lighter Sherman was a little bit less destructive. Secondly, the available Churchills had a 57mm gun, which is a little bit lacking in high explosive oomph compared to that on the M4, uh, which would only be remedied in theatre with the development of the 75NA, which used guns and mantlets from destroyed Shermans. When Churchill finally was dispatched, it turned out they worked well in heterogeneous units mixed in with Shermans. The end of the line. Churchill did not last long in British service, being a little outmoded, especially with Centurion coming along. However, a squadron of Churchill crocodiles survived in 7th RTR long enough to see action in Korea, though in the end they served as gun tanks without their fuel trailers. India and Jordan had them for a short while after the war as well. And then there were the Irish. The British rented out four to Ireland in 1949 at £1,250 apiece for a five-year period. Then, in 1954, the Irish wondered if the British would sell them. Not believing their luck that somebody would actually pay good money for the things, the British agreed. For £1,000 for the lot. By 1955, the engine was getting a bit cantankerous, so they grabbed the Merlin, not a meteor, off of a supermarine sea fire which had just been declared redundant and stuffed it in one of the Churchills. It apparently worked, uh, but it took a lot of effort and they eventually gave up on the idea. By 1967, only two Churchills were left and one was broken down on the gunnery range at the Curragh. Instead of fixing it, they just dismounted the gun and they brought the gun to and from the range to mount into the tank when the gunnery exercises for the crew for the other tank were to be held. 
when that other tank was retired, with only 24 rounds APCBC and 21 rounds smoke left in stores, and there was some discussion as to what to do with the one on the gunnery range. It was decided that the easiest thing to do would be to simply bury it, as was done in 1969. It spent 33 years on the ground before it was recovered, partially restored, and sent to North Ireland as a gift to be used as a monument, where it still sits today. So there you go, five things someone probably didn't know about Churchill. Hope you found it interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one.